Hi everyone, thanks for watching. In this episode, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to break this into four parts. It's going to be an in-depth review of the C300 Mark II from Canon, the Cinema Zoom lenses, as well as the Cinema Primes from Canon, and the Zacuto recoil rig with the Radical HD viewfinder. Now, this was all majorly based off an interview I did with my good friend Serge Romelli on photosurge.com, and I have basically cut that up into four easy to view pieces, with the final one being how to shoot night for day with the C300 Mark II, which was a, a little experiment that I did when doing a short film for Canon. The two biggest complaints that I hear about the C300 Mark II, and this is frame rates and price. Let me tackle frame rates first. It's true you can't do 120 or 200 frames per second on this camera. And I know that's a deal breaker for some people and uh, probably because you have a lot of slow motion work you need to do. For me, it's not a deal breaker and here's why. 99% of my work is done at 24 frames per second or thereabouts, sometimes 30 frames per second depending on the client. That being said, the next big problem that everybody has with this camera is price. I think we all had a little bit of sticker shock and we kind of wanted it to be around $6,000 cheaper. Uh, I'm very camera agnostic, but I needed to face the reality that I had no money and I wanted it to have a great image. And this is why I chose the C300 Mark II over any other camera that I had available that I could afford. And it is because it has the best color signature and the most pleasing skin tones out of pretty much any camera out there. The, the C100 Mark II is also really great in this regard and slightly cheaper, but with the 4K capabilities of the C300 Mark II, and I'll cover why I shot in 4K in the interview. Now I'm gonna put a link up to a blog post that was done by Tim Folk, and he did a great technical review of this camera and some of the pluses and minuses that I didn't have a chance to get into in my interview with Serge. And we also, we, we talked on the phone and we discussed kind of the pros and cons of this camera, and I, I'm pretty sure that we're on the same page when we say this is hands down, the best image you're gonna get out there for the price that it's available at. The next closest thing is gonna be the Alexa Mini, but even then, after I looked at fully fitting out a gear rig that would be ready to roll, you're still talking 60 to $70,000. So 16,000 versus 60, even 50, is quite a leap for people who really don't have a lot of money to spend and are working on micro budget features. So the final thing I want to mention before jumping into the interview is there were two mistakes that I made using this camera. And the first one was a really rookie mistake on my part and just in my franticness I overlooked this, which is when I was looking through the Zacuto viewfinder, I was looking at scopes that were reading the, the IRE off of the LUT that was coming in. And that was a boo-boo on my part. I should have been checking the actual log waveform that was coming off of the C300 Mark II, which you can just access with the click of a button, and that's probably gonna cost me a couple shots. Um, I probably have a little bit more clipping that I would have liked, but we'll see once I get to grading and post, and I'll, I'll sort of update you on that. And the last one is when I was doing some really dark shots on the side of a mountain, no lights to be found anywhere except in the far distance with the city lights, I tried to light it with kind of an, you know, a, an iPhone, basically, to just cast a tiny bit of light on the actor, and just looking at the ungraded shots, there's a little bit more grain than I would have hoped for. And I think most of that's gonna come out with a degraining pass. I'll see what happens when I actually put the final LUTs on and post and all that to see what it really looks like. But my advice would be, if you wanna do crazy nighttime shooting, raise the ISO up a little bit, overexpose it and darken it and post. And I think that's about it. In summary, I cannot wait to buy my own C300 Mark II. This really is an amazing camera. For all of you who are on the fence between going Sony FS7, Canon C300 Mark II, or saving up to buy the Airy Mini, well, let me just say the Airy Mini is a lot more expensive setup than what you're thinking, but you know, if you can afford it, more power to you because it's got some awesome frame rates and it's Airy. The Sony FS7 does have more bang for your buck in terms of technical specs, but ultimately the deciding factor should always be the image. And I think that for the purposes of a film that is more dramatically based or has a lot more focus on the actors as opposed to environments and stuff like that, you always want to look at what has the most pleasing skin tones and what is like the most flattering image overall. And for me, there was no comparison. So hands down, I'm recommending this camera to all my friends who are doing indie filmmaking projects 
because there really is no better image for the price value out there. Even if it stings a little bit with that extra $6,000, the truth is with all the bells and whistles that come with it, it's absolutely worth it. So with all that preamble, here's the interview and uh, I hope you enjoy. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. My name is Serge Ramelli. I am a French photographer living in Paris and also living in Los Angeles, a very sunny city. I'm here with my friend Dare from Dare Cinema and um, we've been working together on, uh, on making movies. This channel is usually about photography, but today I want to talk to you about uh, a movie we just made and I want to talk to you about a sponsorship we had from Canon that really helped us make the movie with some of the most awesome gear there is out there to do movies. Right, Dare? Oh, it was incredible. This is definitely the camera I have been waiting my entire career for. A lot of times you, you know, when you're on a big budget production, really cameras is, is it's not a big, it's not a big line item. You know, it doesn't matter if your camera package is going to cost $10,000 or $250,000. It comes down, it comes down to the choice that the director and the cinematographer want to make stylistically. But when you're doing low budget, no budget work, um, I know over since the DSLR revolution that Canon started, you know, back with Vincent LaFerre and Reverie and all that, mm. a lot of independent filmmakers and and photographers uh, have been, you know, everybody wants the holy grail of cameras, right? Which, you know, you know, it would be like twenty stops of dynamic range, ten K, mm. uh, five hundred frames per second. You know, everybody wants that for less than eight hundred dollars, <laughs> but uh, which is hard. <clears throat> But the cameras have been getting better and better. As I was talking to guys in Canon France, they were explaining to me that yes, it's called a C300 Mark II, but because of the sensor and the quality of the dynamic range, it's a whole new world. Do you confirm? Oh, absolutely. Not even a question. And, um, you know, I can only speak to kind of my peers in this regard because a lot of times, well, over the, since they announced the C300 Mark II, I mean, I had really high hopes for this camera. I just, I love the Canon image. It's just, you know, I don't say, and, and Aerie also has a, fa a fantastic oh, image. Yeah. I've shot on Aries, I've shot on Reds, you know, and I've shot on Sony. Canon and Aerie have the nicest natural look on skin tones. It just is what it is. But the Aerie just has so much more that comes with it. Mm. And to get this package and to be able to get an image that you get with it is was phenomenal to me. I just, it, I, I have no need to go looking for another camera. Yeah, so I don't even know how to use this camera. Like, okay, let's say that I'm just opening up out of the box. I just rented the camera and I want to make a movie. How do you, how do you get started with it? Okay, so first off, when you look at this right now, um, what you're seeing is the Zacuto recoil rig on it. Um, you're seeing a, a Rode microphone there just to, to capture sound so that I can sync the uh, separate sound that was captured and something that the camera is recording at the same time. It's good to have a reference. But other than that, is this, got, a, is this that, comes with the this this top part is a monitor that that comes with it, and uh, you can buy like a little eyepiece that can that can go on this, that, so you could use this as a viewfinder. Right. Um, but that's it doesn't really that's not the greatest configuration for it. It also has a viewfinder here on the back, mm -hmm. um, and they're both clean. They're they're good. But the basic camera package, you pull it out of the box, you're going to have the body, not a lens. You're going to have this on top, which is the, you know, you can control it and all that. And, and that's basically it. Okay. And it can seem, some people can be, oh God, it's, you know, it might look a little bit technical, but basically you just need to turn on the power over here. There's a little on switch over here. Right. It's got camera off and media. Okay. You put it on camera. Um, you, what, what is media? Media so you can play back the shots that oh media you know, is like playback okay yes you can you can play back the shots that you were recording okay. um, the vast majority of your camera functions are here on the side such as zebra peaking waveform monitor all of that is over here now okay. the the great thing about this camera mm -hmm. is you can be up and shooting in in a minute and a half and there is just some weird color magic that 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 canon has in their cameras and, and I know we've talked about this a lot separately in terms of yeah. going over as a canon and yeah, sony you guys know i i shift over to sony um uh, for for still footage because i like to shoot light but i must say that th there's one thing i'm not so hyped about the sony is the color signature i love what canon is doing i love the fact that sony 7 r has got such a dynamic range and that it's very light and I travel a lot, I hike a lot to make landscape photos, but the Canon color are amazing and we've been, you know, basically debating over this since one year where he says like, go for Canon. And anyway, Canon sponsored the movie and 
For videos, I agree Canon is really the best on, I mean, especially that camera, because this is a Canon C300 Mark II, just came out, almost nobody has it. We had like a privilege to use it. All right, so what about the, uh, you want to talk about, we want to talk about the lens, but before you wanted to do something on the menus. Okay, there are a lot, look, we're just covering the, the, the sort of get up and get started type stuff, and also to answer any questions for anybody who's like, I want to shoot my independent film, is this the right camera to do it? because it always comes down to what aesthetic are you trying to get. You sure. know, if you're shooting a sci-fi feature, maybe you want to go with a with a Sony camera or a, a RED camera cuz just to how they hand like you know it's a little bit more video-ish, a little bit more everything's kind of just has this sharpness to it. The skin tones yeah, are a little bit very sharp. More. Yeah, so but once you understand these basic features, once you start opening up the camera in terms of dialing into the menus there are crazy features that you can do. You can push color space for specific white balances with green and magenta, and mm. there's a there's just a bunch of other options that you have in there if mm. you really want to go deep, deep into this camera. Um, before we go into this, uh, can you just uh, brief us uh, on what the movie is? What the movie we just did? What's what is it about? Well, the the movie is called The Hollywoodens, and it's basically about the struggle that artists and filmmakers have when trying to create great art with no money. And basically the, the basic premise of the story is you're trying to make a movie in LA with no money, which in our case is like art imitating life. Right. So um, I knew that we needed to have, uh, well, first off, we couldn't have afforded this. So mm -hmm. thank you, Canon, so much for giving it to us. This <laughs> is, yeah. Like, so, but I knew we needed a small lighting package and we needed a very small camera package um, to be able to move at the speed that we needed to do but I also wanted to make a great looking movie. You know, right. I didn't want to um, cheapen the movie by not having a camera that could capture the magic we wanted to put in front of the lens. Sure. And uh, yeah, and the whole thing is a, is a very light comedy where I play the, the lead character as a, as a French actor just coming from France who hardly, uh, who hardly speaks English. You know, he speaks a bit like this, you know what I mean? Uh, but you know, and uh, he's very uh, over the top, very European and wants to make it in Hollywood. And it was, I was surprised because it was a big shoot. We had like 30 actors, great actors to play the one with us. Yeah. Uh, a lot of location. It's been the dream of my life. Honestly, I, this movie, I hope it's going to come out right, but uh, we had really a lot of fun. And, and that camera really made it also uh, because we just had so little money that we didn't have to light too much, right? And we could move fast. All right, well, let me clear up a, a misconception that some people have. Uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to photographers making the jump to cinematography or even cinematographers who have been working in the low budget, no budget realm, they, they kind of have this idea that, oh, I don't want to have to have any lights at all. And, and that's a misconception. You always need light to, mm. to make a good looking shot. Right. Um, what these cameras have done in recent years is instead of needing $100,000 worth of lights and 50 people to do it, you um, have cameras so sensitive that you can do that for a fraction of a cost and a fraction of the manpower. Mm. You just have to know that, um, don't think that you're gonna point the camera at something and it's magically gonna look amazing with whatever light is available. Yeah. There are a lot of tricks and, and ways you can maneuver people so you're close to natural light sources, but- But um, you still have to, like uh, we had Axel, which is an amazing gaffer, and he was always doing fills and yes. using L small LED panels but then it would look like it was very little light, but it did look great. And, uh, you know, because also the, the, the yes. ambience feel was great with that camera because of the dynamic range, right? Yeah, I mean, there were some night shots where we literally could light it with an LED panel that's smaller than an iPhone and get the exact light we needed. And, and this gets into also the, 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 the ISO and the sensitivity, which I guess we can take those up each as their yeah, individual sure. subjects later. But um, yeah. Okay, so how do we get started with this camera? Uh, that is one of the great things about this camera is that you can literally take it out of the box and as long as the batteries are charged, you can be rolling in minutes. Cool. And the simplicity of it is you've got a, a power on off switch over yeah, here. Which is, yeah, media off of camera. So right. camera. You put it on camera and basically you need to format your cards inside here. There's two slots in the back for two CFast cards. Okay. Uh, we use the Lexar cards. The yeah, Lexar the one, CFast, yeah, CFast 2.0. And how much footage could you get on a 128? You're going to get 42 minutes at the, the highest in-camera resolution setting that there is, which is the, the 4K 10-bit 422 color. You're going to get 42 minutes of recorded footage on that. 
Cool. You also, it has simultaneous recording to SD card in the front, and we used X, SDXC64, uh, and you have 530 minutes on a properly with, formatted card. Which is for proxies. And that gives you, but it's full 2K. Yeah. It's full So HD what proxies, proxies is, let me just explain what proxies is, in case okay. you don't know. Proxies is basically like full 2K or full HD, a bit more than full HD. Very good footage that you actually use to do your editing. And then, because it's really hard to edit 4K, and then once your editing is nice, then you can just synchronize it, and it just does the 4K magic. So we only look basically at the proxies on a daily basis. Right. It's uh, just much lighter, much easier. <clears throat> right. So the, the next thing you need to do is you need to set your camera settings. Are you shooting PAL 25 frames per second? Are you shooting 23.976? Are you shooting 30 frames per second? We're here in the US, um, and I shot this at 23.976. It also has an option to shoot at true 24 frames per second, which some people might want to do, but 23976 was the choice for this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while we're on it, uh, I would just mention that is that, uh, you know, I read a lot on the internet, I'm in the forums, I'm watching the other people doing their videos on this. And, and one of the big points that everybody's complaining about on this camera is the lack of frame rates. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's at 4K, they would expect minimally 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second for slow motion for slow motion and for whatever reason that's i've never had a consideration on that at all and and the reason why is if i'm going to do slow motion and i need slow motion for a commercial or whatever i'm going to go rent a slow motion camera right you know what i mean because even if you look at some of the other cameras such as the sony fs7 and the other ones that have high frame rates the slow motion isn't as clean and noiseless as what you can get on the cameras that are dedicated slow motion cameras. Right. And how many slow motion shots that I have in the 21 days of shooting that we had? I had one. That was it. You know what I mean? So it's mm. when you look. Yeah, it's not, it's not a deal breaker. It's not a deal breaker, but mm. some people think it is. And, and you just have to think with, this is a tool to tell a narrative story. Right. You know what I mean? For, for filmmakers, for document, you know, documentary makers, um, uh, this this camera. I mean, we talked about it back in April. I was like, I, I, you know, maybe there's some way we can get our hands on this camera, right? Because the image is so good. I mean, you really, you know, we'll we'll show some clips here behind so you can sure. see it. Yeah, I know we were very excited with the image quality. I mean, I've never seen something like this. So it, it's really good because this is a fifteen thousand dollars camera. It's not like some of the very high end Aries camera, which I believe are between fifty or eighty thousand dollars. And this is a fifteen thousand dollar car. You can rent this for four hundred dollars a week. It's, you know, for independent movie making, it's within reach. You know. Yeah. And it's and it's like the quality is really uh, it's, great. It's fantastic. And it, it's if you had said, look, let's rent an Airy for this film, I would have said no. And the reason why I would have said no is because you need more people to do it. Yeah. You can't just you can't you, you know you need to be tethered to a DIT station that's set up so you can watch things back and it's a yeah. bigger camera and this just again getting back to the point of you can pick it up and you can start shooting and you can start capturing amazing images and i'm not speaking now from a point of promoting canon mm. i'm speaking now from the point of, as a filmmaker yeah that was the dream camera you would, you've been talking to me for months and i i asked canon if they would help us in the movie and they did and we, you were blown away i remember and yes no, no, okay no question so right back to you you want to set your frame rate Yes. And if you're PAL, it's 25. If you're in the US, it's 23.976 or whatever you want. Um, and then you need to choose your, your, your color format, meaning right. are you shooting just sort of like the natural Canon format? Are you shooting C-Log? Are you shooting C-Log 2? So that, that's three choice. Canon formats of C-Log or C-Log 2? And cinema. And cinema. And it's got a, and it's got a couple others in there. So, okay. But uh, to get it's the 15 stops the dynamic range that they tout on this camera, and. I know that there's some people out there who are like, oh, it's not really true 15 stops. Let me tell you, as a cinematographer, when you're seeing the images on it, sure looks damn close enough to 15 stops to me. Yeah, that's for sure. So which one would you recommend? So it's like the equivalent of color spaces in photography, like Adobe uh, 98 or uh, um, Profoto sRGB. That's the bit equivalent? Yeah, basically. I mean, it's not shooting raw. Right, okay. It's it could, not right? shooting, it, could shoot raw. it cannot shoot raw oh, okay. internally. With an external recorder, you can shoot raw. But, then it gets but again, you're strong. starting to add things onto the camera, and you know, what's the beauty of this camera? You can make an amazing film with what comes out of the box. Yeah, that's so. And we shot cinema mode, right? Okay, because okay. that's 
that's, you know, Canon says, you want the most dynamic range, you need to shoot in cinema mode. Okay? Yeah. And we were shooting about four uh, CFAS cards per day, which is roughly 500 gigabytes per day. Half a, so we had to have two hard drives of 12 terabytes to handle the data. The whole movie is exactly nine terabytes. So we have uh, basically two hard drives, which is each 12 terabytes. Uh, and we just one is a backup, basically. Uh, yes. And we backed up to this two hard drives. So that's a bit tricky because 500 terabytes per day is something, you know? Yeah, and then imagine shooting in raw format. You're, you're now gonna like, woo! Yeah, you know, you're like, probably talking 30 to 50 terabytes at that point. Yeah. Um, on an uncompressed raw format. Which we didn't do. Yeah. Because we were really happy with the cinema setting, right? Yes. Great, great image and you don't have to go through, it, it just takes that chunk out of post-processing. And again, if you're planning on doing a hundred billion dollar blockbuster, none of this means anything to you. You're just like, okay, we're just going to do 0.01%. Yeah. But for the low budget, no budget, that's that's a big consideration to, to, to think of. So. 4K, highest quality in camera settings, you're gonna get 42 minutes per card, you're gonna get uh, 500 minutes of the, the proxy full HD recording, um, and this is at the cinema setting. So, and as he said, about half a terabyte a day. Cool. And those were full days, so. Yeah, very full days. So eight to 11 pages of scripts per day. It was pretty crazy schedule. Yeah. <laughs> we started sometime at eight, finished at two in the morning. It was crazy, crazy, crazy. Oh yeah, the better, how is the battery life on this one? Crazy good, crazy good. The batteries on this is, you get, uh, I'm pretty sure it comes with the two full-size batteries and it's, you know, when you plug it in, the battery cover doesn't close because the batteries are so big, but mm. we were getting like seven hours solid, I wanna say, on wow. each battery. There was never a day where, even if we shot an 18 hour or even a 20 hour day, where those two batteries didn't last through the day. Now, that being said, uh, I did always have the charging station on site so that as soon as the first battery was dead, I was charging yeah. the other one Security. just in case. But you never had the problem. Crazy good batteries on this. Cool. You know, no longer would I, like in when I was shooting like a lot of uh, DSLR work, I would always have like the extra battery pack, the 14 volt battery pack that would be powering up the whole system and don't need that on this. Mm. And one thing that surprised you because I'm not used to using professional cinema thing, I'm a photographer, is that you know, in photography, we, we use shutter speed, we use aperture and ISO to do our exposure. Here is a different world. Usually the, um, the shutter speed is set to 140th of a second. Most of the movie was like that, right? And you were just playing around with ISO and, um, and basically the, the manual um, uh, um, aperture. The manual, aper the manual aperture yes. for your image, right? Yes. And uh, yeah, the, um, that's the two settings you would change basically. Basically, on the lenses that we used, we have manual uh, aperture settings, manual right. focus, and manual zoom. Now, if you're using an L-series lens, you control the aperture right back here. There's a wheel down here on the side. And similar to how you control it on your DSLR camera, you just spin that wheel and it will uh, change your aperture. Okay, so but not on a manual lens. You have to do it here. Manual lens, you have to do it here. Okay. And with the can, I'll just mention this quickly while we're on it with the Canons, uh, the camera actually records the, the data of what was your focal length, what was your aperture setting, yeah. uh, which is really cool. Data. Yeah, it really, it's, so that's, that's kind of a cool thing about the Canon. Even with the manual lenses. Even with the manual lenses. Which is not always the case in the DSLR, DSLR world. We don't always get the exif data when we shoot with manual lenses, so that's cool. Okay, and what about uh, ISO? Uh, so ISO, um, this camera in it, I believe it has an extended mode, which goes up to a hundred thousand ISO, which is ridiculous. Um, but just as it is out of the box, it goes from, I think it's 160 all the way up to 25,600. Okay. So let's watch some, here. We have some night shots going on. Uh, so what was the max ISO that you went up to? Do you remember? I, anytime I needed to push the ISO, I very rarely pushed it over 1250. Wow. Sometimes I went up to 2000 because even though the noise handling is good, anytime you start going above uh, native ISO, you are going to have noise, whether it's detectable by the human eye or not. Hmm. So the native ISO on this camera is 800 ISO. Um, I'm really happy that it goes down to uh, one, maybe even goes down to 100. I don't remember, but for sure 160. 160. I think in the extended mode, it goes down to 100. Yeah, so, that, so that's something that's surprising to photographers because the native uh, ISO for Nikon camera is 200 ISO and for camera camera is 100 ISO, but for movie cameras it's different. 
This is 800 ISO, it's a native. That's the best settings. So when they go to 160, they're sort of doing some electronic things to make it less, make sensitive. It less sensitive. Okay, yeah. And um, so we're talking about going up on the high end of ISO right now. And um, I did do some shots at 2000 ISO and, um, you know, and I could see the noise starting to come in. You know, it's, it's yeah. pleasing noise, not, not like radical. It's something I know I can run through a, a really quick denoiser and get rid of it. But, you know, it's, it's not still... My, 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 sorry, not Miami Vice noise from a, that movie because... <laughs> okay. <laughs> we go. love Michael Mann. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, no, but you, you make a good point because if you look at what digital cam cinema cameras were, like if you look at Collateral, yeah. Um, I think that was shot on the Viper stream, but this is one of the first cameras. It's crazy how noisy that is. It still looks incredible. I love it. Yeah, but it was a lot film. of noise. It's uh, crazy noise. On, on a big screen, there's a lot of noise. It's crazy. And, and you know, this one, you think, is, has less noise than that? <laughs> not, it's, not even, it's not even a question. That's so funny how this has progressed over the last years. It's amazing. Yeah. So we're talking about ISO. Okay. So on the, you know, when you don't have enough light, that's just one problem. Okay. okay. And that's solved by boosting up the ISO to where you want it. Also, you can, um, you know, you can go down, the cinema zooms go down to 2.8, at least these are the compact zooms, I believe. They go down to 2.8, which, right. is, which is really great. Um, and then sometimes, which I'm gonna show you on some of these night shots, what I like to do is I like to use the 1.285 millimeter. It gives you, I don't, it's, to me, it's magic. The, the look that you can get, the bouquet in the background, um, and this is where you really start to see the power of a prime versus a zoom, because they're, the difference between 1.2 and, and 2.8 is phenomenal. It's and it's not just in the way it handles the highlights in the background. It's the way that the light wraps around the skin. The, the, the you know yeah. because not everything is super sharp. Right. You know it it oh, I love it, the look. Yeah. It gives an almost angelic beauty to to some of these. So we'll show you some of that footage. Um, now here's the other side of the ISO problem. Uh, you're going to go outside and suddenly. Uh, if you want to shoot at anything below f8 and you're even at ISO 160, it's too bright. And this has two, four, six stops of ND built in. With That's these two amazing. little these two little buttons here on the side. Yeah. You just go plus, minus, minus, and I believe in extended mode it even has ten stops. Wow. So That's amazing because I keep putting ND filters on you know, to get long exposures in photography or if you want to make videos and you know and you have too much light, and here it's in the camera, which is really cool. And, and that is, one, without a doubt, one of the greatest features of this camera, because I like to shoot, you know, between F4 and, and 2. Like, yeah. above, unless I have a shot where I really want... Everything in focus. Everything in focus, you know what I mean? But the point of depth of field and focus is to tell the audience what's important in yeah. the scene. Where should they be looking? And when you're doing landscapes, that's just part of the language of the movie, so you, you want everything in focus. You want right. them to be able to, to do that, and you use color to pick out certain things that you want. So having the built-in ND filters, you can just bam, 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 just, just rapidly yeah. go up to whatever you need, so you're, you can like be shooting almost directly at the sun, and you're good to go. Cool. So that's ISO and kind of the range and how we shot that. Cool. All right. Uh, uh, any other things that sh people should know to get started with the camera that's important about the peaking or, or? Um, there's a few functions here, which is um, you should get familiar with how to read a waveform monitor. And both here on the top, um, you have WFM, which is this, this button number eight, which you can press and it gives you a monitor that you can look at. And also here on the side, you have one of the selectable buttons right here between peaking, zebra, magnification. Yeah, and, and we can take WFM. a each of these. Why is it important to understand the waveform monitor? There's, there's a lot of information and a lot of studying that you can do on a waveform monitor. But here's Which the, is the equivalent of the histogram for photography, basically. Yeah. What do you want to know? You don't want stuff hitting zero and you don't want stuff hitting 100. Right. At zero, the information is gone. It's pure black. At 100, it's pure white, sort of depending on the sensor. You can go, like, sometimes you can still pick out details, like, above that, but... You just don't yeah. want it, unless you're deliberately trying to do it for a specific effect that you're trying to get, try and make sure that you don't have any highlights that are going above 90. And, and it was very rare, getting back to now the dynamic range, um, this is where you, the, you start to see the camera shine because you're looking at the waveform monitor and you're seeing the face mm. and you see this bright white background and, and shooting DSLR before you might be like, 
there's nothing there. Hmm. And then you focus on the background and you still have all these subtle variations in color. It's, it's amazing. Hmm. It's, it's uh, cool. Yeah, it's great. So let's go quickly over the buttons. So the first one is ISO again, we went over. So yep. uh, shutter, now what do you, with button number six with this shutter, do you do anything with that? That's when you want to go for. Okay, let's talk about shutter speed for a second. Cool. And you can change the shutter speed on the camera. We, we spoke about this briefly uh, at the beginning, but um, there's two different ways you can control shutter in here. And one is by shutter angle and one is by shutter speed. Okay. They're both talking the same thing. Okay. Cool. And with this, you're basically controlling motion blur. Now you might remember in the old handy cams, like how they had that old film look and you could kind of get these light streaks and mm. you know, like dreamy sort of look. Yeah. That's a lower shutter speed. Right. So if you're down at 1 15th or something like that, that's how you can kind of get that surreal yeah. look, yeah. which if you're doing music videos, maybe you want to do. Then you go on the other end of the, the spectrum and you're going at your high shutter speeds and you have like saving private Ryan where you have oh, that really, the whole fighting scene was got here at the, very, very clear, no motion blur. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's basically what you're controlling. But if you're going to get into that, I recommend just doing camera testing and just use, do your, a basic setup and then go through it. Did you change the shutter speed during the entire movie? Not once. No. 148 the entire movie. That's it. Because it's all this movie needed. It cool. wasn't, there was no need for me to go out that. I said it's 180 degree shutter angle, which at 23.976 is 148th of a second. Cool. All right. Then we have button number seven, which is uh, frame rate. Did you change this one? Frame rate? No. 23.976. Okay, cool. And then we have number one, which is magnification, right? Well, let's go back to frame rate for a second. And okay. again, let's just briefly touch upon that because it is... Go ahead. It, yes, thank you. Um, frame rate is uh, something that people can sort of put too much attention on in, in, in my opinion. It's if you're going to be telling a narrative story and you're, you're going the approach of a filmic look, which after a hundred years has been established one of the main, one of the main elements between dynamic range, depth of field is frame rate. Hmm. It's 24 frames per second in the U S okay. That's what it is. And when we talked about this movie at the start, we wanted that sort of, uh, we wanted an independent film kind of low budget, but with a, you know, with that amount of motion blur, okay. you know, because there are films that are shooting a lot at 30 frames per second these days because it matches internet footage. Mm. It's not a lot of motion blur. It has a video like setting and right. you can get that from this camera if you want that, if that's what you're going for. That just happened to be, we didn't, we didn't want that. Yeah. We wanted the cinema. We we're telling you a story. We wanted to look at cinema has been looking for the last 50 years, which is a cinema look. and that helps being at 24. It does. It's just 23, 98, right? Same basic thing. Same thing. Okay, Same cool. basic thing. But, um, and this camera will go up to 60 frames per second in 2K, I believe, but we shot the whole thing in 4K. Hmm. And I just, I didn't need it. So. No. Okay, why, do you, why did you shoot in 4K just as a little thing? Why do you want this whole movie to be 4K? Two reasons. One, future proof. There are any digital distribution that you're looking for. Everybody is going 4K now, just because now with the amount of displays and whatnot that you mm -hmm. have in, and more so than that, uh, when we went to the movies and we saw, I saw Terminator Genesis, I yes. think it was, which in my opinion got unnecessarily bagged on. But aside from that, I saw it once in a theater where it was projected in 2K. And then when, um, I think it was when we went and saw it, I saw it in 4K and I couldn't believe the difference. Uh, like same movie, yeah, two different projections and the crispness yeah. blew me up. Like, yeah, I just it, saw the Spielberg in 4K. Yeah. Uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Bridge of Spy, amazing. I mean, the photography is like, wow. Yeah. On, on a real 4K screen, it's really something. So that's now, and, and I want this to be projected theatrically. For home projection, for home projection, if that was the only audience that I thought it might go to, I might not shoot in 4K. Hmm. Because honestly, 4K, even on a screen that's eight feet wide, which only the richest people in the world have, um, you, I don't know. It's, it almost feels too crisp yeah. in that environment. But in a movie theater, it's great. Yeah. And okay. the other reason is, um, it gives me latitude in post to punch in a little bit. And this is something that like a lot of people, you know, people are shooting on 8k. Why? Because they can shoot a master and they can practically punch in on a close up in that same master. Yeah. Now you really have to be spot on in your focus if you want to do that. 
because yeah. you know otherwise if you're soft and you punch in it's yeah. just going to look bad soft as well so but that's why 4k okay cool so let's carry on then we have the uh, uh button number one magnification that's Okay, magnification button. If you press this, what it's gonna do is it's basically gonna blow up the screen and that just helps you check focus. You'll see it in the viewfinder or if you have a plugged in um, viewfinder like this, it, you can do it there. Cool. Uh, peaking, number two. Peaking is basically a focus tool which helps you check to make sure you have critical focus. And usually it's set to red, but they have other colors that you can use. Like yeah, like white. on the Sony 7R, I use that a lot for because I have a lot of manual lens, so you just see in red what's in focus, what's not in focus, right? Yes. But I find the magnification to be more precise than, than the focus peaking, per my own experience. I don't usually rely on peaking unless I'm shooting down at 1.2. Okay. And at which point, because sometimes it can just be distracting, and really, you know, if you have, if you correctly set your viewfinder and it's, it's matched to, you know, your, how your eye sees, then you're gonna see if it's crisp or not. Cool. So the next one is zebra. What right. is zebra? I know the animal. Yes. No, zebra, for those of you who don't know, is basically a tool that many video cameras have to help you see which areas of the image are either overexposed or approaching overexposure. So when you press it, you get this little yes. strikes. Oh, and it tells you which is... So it doesn't mean it's necessarily overexposed. It's getting close to be overexposed. Yes. And, and you can change what it means. Like, um, I kind of... Uh, had it set to 80. Okay. So any parts of the image that, you know, we talked about earlier about in the way. Oh, that's over 80% of exposure. Hmm. Roughly speaking. Um, cool. And uh, so it just it helps you quickly see that. I don't, I don't keep it on. It's more of just a quick check, but really with the waveform monitor, I rarely ever need it. Cool. You know, but it's just there as like a, let's say you're following someone around. It can just show you which areas might be pro uh, brighter than others. Okay, and I guess about the next one is WFM, which stands for waveform, I guess, and button number four. Yes. That's what you talked about earlier. Yes. So you just press it, you see the waveform, which is a, like a real-time histogram, and you know, making sure your blacks is not crushed, your white is not crushed, and, but yes. because it's got so much dummy crunch, that baby, we hardly had ever the trouble. No. That's what's crazy about it. Yeah. Okay, great. Moving on, starts and stop, I guess, it starts and stop the, the recording. Oh, white balance. I see white balance here. Okay, so there are a few different white balance modes you have. Um, you have sort of, you know, and, and if you're shooting a lot on DSLR cameras, you know, you've got, sometimes you have like shade, portrait, uh, underwater, yeah. you know, on the moon, you know, <laughs> intergalactic. You have like a hundred different settings. And on here you kind of have uh, incandescent or tungsten. Yeah. Uh, you have daylight. Okay. And then you have an A and a B to set custom white balances. Hmm. And then you have direct control over the Kelvin setting. Um, and I know um, for photographers, sometimes trying to make the jump to video shooting. Hmm. And, and again, realize this isn't shooting raw. So if you're shooting raw, white balance can be fixed in post whenever you want. Yeah. But when you're, when you're shooting this, you're setting your white balance at the start. And you just kind of you want the colors to look natural in the scene, unless you're going for a really warm look, in which case you can kind of bump mm -hmm. it up that way. But my, so my philosophy is try to get as close to, to what you're actually perceiving, uh, so where whites are white, and do the rest in post. Whites are whites, the rest in post, yeah. That has been my biggest difficulty as a video maker, of coming from the raw world, where I don't care at all about the white balance, I change it in Lightroom. Here, you have to be very careful. Because if you're too warm, yes, you can add blue uh, in you know in F, in color corrections, but it's gonna be tricky. It's if if you took the wrong white balance, and especially when you do like mastering close up and close up, make sure the white balance uh, matches. Yeah. So were you using the Kelvin settings the most of the times or the pre settings? If I was outside, um, I would kind of start at daylight, and if it looked good, if it looked how I wanted, I would leave it on daylight. Okay, but. 90% of the shoot, I would use the Kelvin setting and just set my temperature. Um, you can, it has the, it has auto white balance too, which I Works. never use that, never, just <laughs> because a shadow goes over and suddenly the scene looks completely different. Right. Um, but you can also get a gray card or a white card and you put it in front so it fills the screen and you choose to set the white balance. Oh, which is that the next button? What? No? It, it's on it's on it. There's two buttons to basically yeah. cycle through the, web, the white balance functions over there. Cool. Um, well, that's pretty much it. I mean, then, then you've got two wheels. What are the two wheels for? These are just wheels that you can use to navigate through the different functions. Uh, and um, like I said, when you're putting a, 
uh, DSLR L series lens on here, that bottom wheel is already geared to controlling the aperture. Cool. Um, but like, let's say when you select ISO, you need to scroll oh. through yeah. 100. You use the wheel to scroll through it. It's great. So it's very easy to use. Yes. And those are kind of the, the buttons that you see on here. There's a few other things. Um, like you have a, a mic, you can plug a mic directly into here. Okay. Um, you have this this stand here, which has two XLR inputs for mic, and this is great. And um, is, you know, is, is that is that with and that's with the camera? This comes with the camera. Oh, the XLR is with the camera. That's great. So that's you can right. Get... And it just goes into the hot shoe mount right on the top. Um, it's got these two cables, which are fantastic now that you can disconnect them. And the C three hundred before it was fixed, and it was you know you can mm. it, you know it was not the greatest design choice and they've, they've really done a lot to fix this up. Is there a lot of difference between this buttons where it's on? Because I know you shot a lot with the old C C300 Mark I or? If C you have shot with the C300 Mark I or the C100 or the C500, you're gonna pick up and know how to use this camera. There's, the only thing you will need to do is go into the menus and make sure that you're putting it on Cinema Log or C Log 2 or, you know, but that's, it's cool. pretty much, it's just, it's a much better codec. It's a much better, more robust um, capture format 